Hey, nice beard. Wow. My neck of the woods, I call that a deer hunting beard. Um, anyway, uh, welcome everyone to the State Department. Happy Friday. Uh, just a couple of uh, uh, unfortunate events to uh, uh, note at the top of the briefing, and then I'll take your questions. Uh, first of all, uh, we condemn the attack today in Madagali, Nigeria, uh, that has reportedly killed at least uh, 30 individuals and wounded many more. Uh, after a period of relative calm for the people of northeastern Nigeria, this tragic attack is a reminder uh, of the need to remain vigilant uh, and maintain a sense of urgency uh, in the fight against Boko Haram. The United States supports Nigeria and its Lake Chad Basin neighbors uh, in their effort to defeat the group and ensure the safety and security of all its citizens. And we send our condolences, obviously, to the victims and the families uh, of the, and the people uh, of Nigeria. Also, uh, we condemn the attack earlier today in Cairo, Egypt, that killed several police officers. Uh, we express our condolences to uh, their families and their friends and loved ones, and certainly extend our sympathies to the injured and hope for a speedy recovery. Uh, the United States also stands with the people of Egypt as they confront violent extremism and work to defeat this threat. Uh, the United States uh, strongly supports a stable, secure, and prosperous future for all Egyptians. That's it, Matt. Could you um, run us through what's been agreed um, for the, the meeting in Geneva on the, on the situation in Aleppo? And, and perhaps also talk a bit about uh, your assessment of the situation on the ground in the, in, in the city? Sure. Um, well, the Secretary actually himself spoke to this uh, a short time ago uh, in Paris. I think it was at a meet and greet with uh, some of the embassy uh, families and uh, personnel there. Um, and I thought that he put it actually in a very succinct uh, way, which is, you know, what we're trying to do here uh, is how do we, uh, in essence, save the city of Aleppo from being uh, completely leveled, destroyed? Um, how do we end the current round of fighting, uh, which, as I said, has completely devastated uh, much of the city uh, in order to get medical assistance, in order to get humanitarian assistance, in order to get uh, other assistance into the uh, civilian population that's trapped there, but also how do we get uh, access to these people so hopefully we can find a, a way out. So, uh, uh, as I think you know, he spoke with uh, uh, Lavrov, uh, I think, yesterday. I don't think, I don't believe they've spoken today. Um, and the next step is uh, technical talks to begin in Geneva uh, tomorrow. Um, and uh, um, <clears throat> Uh, again, uh, these are going to be primarily focused on, one, a pause in the fighting, uh, and two, uh, how do we get deliver, uh, rather, into Aleppo uh, to these uh, uh, entrapped uh, civilians, uh, humanitarian aid, and then thirdly, how do we get a safe departure for those who wish to leave uh, the city? And of course, more broadly speaking, uh, you know, uh, we want to see, uh, obviously, political uh, track and process uh, back up and running in Geneva but obviously there's also more urgent concerns at this point in time. Yeah. Of course. Now, the technical talks tomorrow, uh, the, the buzz around these meetings is that the expectation is that there's an imminent agreement for the departure of all militants from the, whatever remains of Eastern Aleppo. Do you have any comment on that? Is that I don't, you and, and I'm, I'm deliberately uh, mm -hmm. not going to, and that's not to, speculate in any way or lend credence to what uh, you're saying. I'm simply not going to get in front of what those discussions are. Uh, all I will say, and I've said, we've said this throughout the week, is that, you know, there are issues that still need to be resolved, uh, uh, questions that still need to be answered, uh, and that's the intent of the meetings tomorrow. Um, I won't even say we're closer. Um, we're continuing to work hard at this, uh, you know, and uh, obviously we do so with the understanding that Aleppo is uh, – is under, and I, this, I'm sorry, I didn't get to this, Matt, your question, but um, is still under intense uh, fighting. Uh, we saw, I think, a brief pause uh, yesterday, but uh, all too brief. Uh, there's been no uh, consistent pause in the fighting that we've seen. Please, go. You know, I mean, I'll take you to what sorry. the, the – sorry, uh, uh, what the um, Foreign Minister of Russia said. He said that, you know, we have some 
something, you know, some surprise. I mean, in casting like a positive or encapsulating the word surprise in a positive uh, context that we might have a surprise tomorrow. So are you are you disputing that, that, you know, something positive may come out of these meetings tomorrow? Uh, far from disputing it, we'd obviously welcome something positive coming out of these meetings. I mean, and I'm not trying to be glib or, or funny. Um, uh, I, I just don't want to get in front. I mean, we've well, everybody in this room knows what a difficult process this has been. And so I don't want to lean forward, uh, you know, uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, comments notwithstanding. I don't want to lean forward in any way, shape, or form and try to uh, um, uh, convey that we think there's going to be some kind of breakthrough. As I said, our immediate goal is to stop the violence, uh, get a sustainable pause in the fighting. Uh, that's obviously the most urgent need here. Uh, if we can get beyond that, where we can look at other uh, aspects of, uh, uh, of putting in place a more credible ceasefire, of allowing safe passage for some of the moderate opposition, those are all things we can discuss, but the immediate uh, urgent need is an end to the fighting. Why would you or why wouldn't you go ahead and encourage such a, an outcome when may, most of the fighters have really left and a lot of them even went to Western Aleppo and so on? You have the you know, the extremists from Zenki and other Nusra and others, they're, they're, of course, they're diehards. They will continue to fight. But why wouldn't that be like something that you would announce, you know, to the world and say, we want the fighters to leave, so in order to spare whatever violence that is taking place? Well, again, we're not speaking on behalf of the opposition. We're obviously in close contact with them. Uh, we've been so uh, throughout. Um, you know, we're not going to speak on their behalf. Um, I think, as I said, I'm not trying to discourage uh, uh, any kind of longer-term resolution to the fighting in and around Aleppo and how that might be uh, uh, formalized, uh, whether it means uh, safe passage for the rebels or the opposition, rather, or whatever. Uh, all I'm saying is the immediate goal is a cessation uh, so we can get humanitarian assistance in and we can get safe passage for uh, civilians out. Yeah, go ahead, Dan. I'm My sorry. question is similar to that one. Yeah. I was going to phrase it slightly differently. Obviously, there are different ways to bring an end to the fighting, which is your, your, your primary goal. One of them would be for one side to win. Yeah. Is it a U.S. policy or a U.S. objective going into these talks that part of Eastern Aleppo remain in moderate rebel hands? Or are you neutral on who controls the ground at the end so long as you get your humanitarian access? Uh, again, I don't want to get into uh, uh, the substance or the preconditions uh, of what maybe we uh, what we may have going into the talks uh, tomorrow in Geneva. Um, <clears throat> uh, I, I think I'll just stay where I was, which is you know our uh, focus is on uh, an end to the violence. Uh, we're still looking at ways uh, that we can get that in place. Um, Obviously, as I said, there's uh, there's concern uh, uh, about uh, the uh, imminent fall of Aleppo. Um, we don't know, uh, frankly, uh, when or even if that will take place. Uh, certainly, you've seen the regime to make gains uh, over the past uh, week or so. Um, but, you know, there's been a tremendous cost to the civilian population. So, again, our focus is on a pause in the fighting. I don't want to talk uh, or get ahead of uh, what we may also discuss in terms of um, uh, uh, longer-term uh, goals. Are you mitigating a regime victory, uh, its effect on civilians, or are you trying to avert a regime sure. victory? Um, again, I think we're just, you know, uh, we've been very clear uh, that even if the regime does uh, uh, retake Aleppo completely, uh, we don't believe uh, that ultimately it's going to secure a total victory in this conflict. So uh, I'm not trying to say Aleppo doesn't strategically matter uh, by any means, uh, but what I'm trying to say is uh, it's been long our contention that even if Aleppo does fall, it's not going to end the conflict. Uh, and so uh, what we need is, whether it was yesterday, whether it's today, whether it's tomorrow, whether it's a week from now, we'd like it sooner, obviously. Um, is an end to the fighting where it is taking place right now in Aleppo, uh, where we can get access uh, to uh, these civilian populations.
question yeah, Saudi Arabia. Uh, can, can I extend Syria on Syria? Sure. Syria. We'll finish a couple more on Syria. Yeah, go ahead, Saeed. Yeah, yeah, uh, on, on Syria. Um, um, do you have any comment on the waiver that was issued by the White House on sending arms to Syrian rebels? Uh, yesterday, the president gave a waiver to, to send arms to Syrian rebels. Is that connected to Raqqa battle, possibly? Or is it being sent to any particular group, like the the, um, the, the Kurdish units uh, in the north and so on? Because apparently the U.S. is trying to work out all these groups together and mobilizing them for the liberation of, of Raqqa. Yeah, um, so I probably referred to DOD about this uh, waiver. Uh, you're talking about the waiver uh, that was issued yeah, yesterday. Sorry to interrupt, but it was sent to the State Department and DOD because you guys have to approve it. Again, DOD has spoken, I think, frequently about uh, uh, their activities to build um, – build up local um, forces uh, that can defeat ISIL. Uh, and um, and uh, since Syria is a state sponsor of terrorism, uh, from time to time the president has to enact uh, or waive, I guess, restrictions uh, that would otherwise prohibit the U.S. military from uh, providing assistance, uh, lethal assistance to our partners who are carrying out uh, these activities against, as I said, Daesh or ISIL. Um, so uh, I'd refer you to the uh, Department of Defense to speak so more specifically. We're, we're not likely to see an influx of lethal weapons, let's say, to the rebels in Aleppo, are we? No. Thank you. Actually, I just, just want yeah, um, on, on to, that, on that subject. Yep. So uh, a few days ago, you were asked about MAMPATS uh, and the authority that the latest Defense Authorization Act uh, gives to the President to send those MAMPATS to the rebels, and Correct. you said, and I quote, uh, I mean, we've been very clear that we're not going to provide lethal assistance to the opposition in Syria, end quote. How does this waiver the president just ordered square with what you said a few days ago? Are you surprised? So, no. Um, so, uh, first of all, our position regarding manpads hasn't changed. What I said the other day still holds. Um, we don't want to see that kind of weaponry. Assistance. Let me finish. We don't want to see that kind of weaponry. Uh, getting into Syria. Um, uh, in terms of more broadly speaking, uh, I was referring specifically to uh, the moderate opposition. Now, we have worked with, uh, and I'm not going to speak beyond what I just said to Saeed, but we have provided some level of assistance uh, to uh, the Syrian Democratic Forces that are fighting in northern Syria against Daesh. Um, that's on top of uh, the advice uh, and training that we provided uh, these groups. Uh, and the reason we've done that is that they've been highly effective in uh, going after and destroying Daesh on the battlefield in northern Syria. Uh, I'm not going to speak to the level of our assistance beyond that. What I was referring to the other day, specifically to your question, uh, was about uh, moderate opposition uh, who are uh, fighting the regime in, Alep in Aleppo but elsewhere. But, but this um – this quote, it's it's not quite accurate, right? And then you, when you're saying, I think I just clarified. Very clear I think I just clarified. Lethal I said, I think I just clarified. Um, clarify. Uh, okay, okay. W with this waiver, uh, who is going to get those weapons? What groups? In what regions? I'm not going to speak to that. I said you can. Uh, either of you can go to DOD, ask them for more details. Um, in generally speaking, I can say it's, uh, we're talking about partner forces uh, that we're working with in northern Syria. Yeah, uh, just, just um, yeah, go ahead. a few more. So, so the president said with this waiver that it is um, in U.S. Uh, national security interest to provide weapons to Syrian rebels. And I, I assume that it is also in U.S. national security interest to make sure that these weapons don't end up in the hands of criminals and terrorists. Can the administration guarantee that? So. Uh, of course, it's in – and again, we've talked about this at great length um, – you know, one of the reasons we are taking these actions against uh, Daesh um, is because it's in our national security interest to do so. Um, <clears throat> look, uh, the threat that Daesh poses for the region uh, is very real and urgent. Uh, the coalition that this country led in forming has done more to turn the tide against Daesh than any effort that – by the way, Russia or any other uh, uh, effort by the regime in Syria has attempted uh, or alleged to attempt uh, in and around Aleppo and elsewhere when they said they've been going after ISIL. We stand by our record. Uh, we have uh, uh, put 
ISIL or Daesh under tremendous pressure. Uh, wherever it holds territory, it's lost much of the territory. It hasn't made any territorial gains in the past year and a half. Uh, and that pressure is going to continue. Now, how we've done this is by working with local groups on the ground, a variety of them uh, in northern Syria, uh, and, uh, and they've been effective, as I said, at dislodging uh, Daesh. Now, with respect to your question, um, uh, the assistance that we provide to these groups uh, is obviously done uh, under careful monitoring. Uh, but, of course, I'm never going to be able to say on any given battlefield, and we've talked about this before, that uh, equipment, uh, assistance can't change hands, uh, but we haven't seen it uh, recently. And, in fact, and to the contrary, as ISIL has lost territory, uh, as it's been on the run, uh, we've not seen any examples of that. But, again, this is a, uh, I guess, a, an area or territory uh, where uh, there is a variety of arms from a variety of different sources <clears throat> over, vari over many decades. Uh, so, uh, you know, for anyone to be able to say with complete confidence that uh, any equipment or assistance is in changing hands uh, on the, from the battlefield or wherever uh, is, uh, is difficult to do at, at best. What will happen to these weapons after the rebels fight ISIL? Who will they be turned against? Uh, again, I mean, I, it, look, this is all, and this is something we've been working very hard uh, on, and this is the last question on this, um, working as we uh, um, liberate, or these groups, frankly, uh, uh, the Syrian Democratic Forces liberate territory uh, in Syria. Uh, we work to bring and provide uh, st stability uh, back into these cities, uh, work with local governments, uh, local councils to reestablish stability in these uh, in these areas. We're also working with these groups, and we've this is something that uh, our special envoy uh, Brett McGurk has, uh, you know, is in constant contact with uh, many of these groups as well as with uh, Turkish authorities and others in the region uh, on what comes next, uh, and uh, and that's something we're looking at down the road. Um, but uh, you know, the immediate uh, priority here is uh, defeating Daesh. And uh, like I said, we wish, we wish, we wish uh, that, you know, other uh, foreign actors uh, in Syria had those same aims. Uh, what about, is, is I, it I, only I, against I've Daesh? I've answered your questions. Or, Please, uh, go ahead. Well. Yes. I've, I've answered your questions. So, Saudi Arabia? Sure, go ahead. Um, so the State Department told Congress yesterday that um, it had approved uh, military sales to Saudi Arabia worth three and a half billion dollars. Um, mostly for Chinook um, yep. helicopters and other equipment. Um, mm -hmm. Human rights groups uh, have cr obviously criticized the Saudi campaign in Yemen um, because of the, the number of civilians killed. Um, and specifically, Human Rights Watch put out a statement yesterday saying, you know, numbering, uh, describing a number of um, airstrikes that had killed civilians and saying that U.S. military equipment had been used in those strikes. Um, putting the U.S. at risk for being complicit in those civilian deaths. Um, what would the State Department say to that? Sure. Um, that's a complicated question, so I'll try to break it down. If I miss anything, uh, please come back to me. Um, so as you noted, on December 7th, the administration did formally notify Congress uh, of its intent to offer Saudi Arabia the purchase of up to uh, I think 48 uh, Chinook heavy lift cargo helicopters and associated equipment uh, via our FMF, uh, FMS, which is foreign military sales. Uh, I think this proposed sale is uh, valued at uh, $3.5 uh, billion. Uh, this obviously followed uh, extensive uh, informal consultations with uh, Congress. Um, our overall review uh, uh, of assistance uh, to the Saudi-led coalition is ongoing. Uh, we continue uh, to have very serious concerns about uh, some of these coalition strikes uh, that have resulted in civilian casualties, and we've addressed uh, uh, these concerns to the Saudi government. Um, uh, we do assist uh, Saudi Arabia with uh, the defense of its territorial integrity. And, but that said, we're going to continue to press uh, the coalition uh, to uh, remediate uh, what we believe are flaws in its targeting uh, cycle and to take other immediate steps to uh, mitigate against any other future uh, civilian casualties. Um, and it goes without saying that, you know, it's also important that we uh, continue to work at uh, the UN-led mediated uh, peace process. I mean, that ultimately is the, the, the best way to uh, end the fighting uh, in Yemen uh, that threatens uh, 
uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, uh, with respect to, um, and forgive me, but I'm trying to answer all the aspects of your question, but with respect to, you know, uh, how this particular sale might affect uh, uh, Saudi Arabia's military capabilities, uh, these helicopters I don't think are anticipated to be delivered in for some two to three years. Um, and uh, certainly their use uh, or the potential use was evaluated as part of our review. Um, it was ultimately decided that um, their role would be to improve uh, Saudi Arabia's heavy lift uh, capability and strengthen its homeland defense. And what do I mean by that? Uh, in the event of a natural disaster or a humanitarian emergency in the region, um, these types of helicopters can provide uh, expedited heavy lift uh, for personnel and supplies uh, in and out of the affected area. <clears throat> um, uh, what else did I forget? On your, are you talking about the status of the review? I mean, as I said, I think I answered this. It's, you know, they're, they're still ongoing. We're still looking at this. Um, uh, we do want to make sure that, and this goes with any uh, foreign military sales, that there's always, they're always subject to end use monitoring. Uh, and uh, we'll continue to look at that even with uh, 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 existing sales uh, uh, with regard to Saudi Arabia. Uh, all of this stuff is under review, including, as I said, uh, um, uh, the uh, overall review of, of defense sales to Saudi Arabia. Well, well, as you said, it's a heavy lift helicopters, but you're also simultaneously selling about 30 Apaches to the United Arab Emirates. Those are attack helicopters, and the Emirates are part of the coalition. They have no use for humanitarian operations. Right. Um, again, uh, I, I don't have the details of uh, those uh, uh, helicopter sales. Um, what I just say is uh, what I just said, which is that you know any military sale is going to be subject to uh, end use monitoring. Have you basically told? Are you, is is one of the conditions of the of the sale that you know the Chinook helicopters can't be used in the Yemen campaign? Um, well, uh, I, I, I don't know that we've, uh, again, I think that uh, Saudis uh, are well aware um, of our, I mean, because they've obviously been uh, a, a purchaser or a buyer of uh, U.S. military equipment. Uh, they're well aware of some of the restrictions and some of the end use monitoring that we conduct as normal part of our sales. Uh, I don't know that there's been any uh, precondition uh, placed on this sales uh, that they not be used. Um, but again, what these, this particular type of helicopter is not, uh, as uh, Dave uh, just said, not uh, designed for combat role uh, as an attack helicopter. Um, what's it? it does uh, for self-defense. I mean, obviously, they do have, yes. That, that review, I think the NSC yep. said in a statement back in October after mm -hmm. the, the funeral um, procession or the gathering was right. bombed, they, they said, quote, you know, we're starting in a, a, quote, immediate review of the assistance to the Saudi campaign. I mean, now we're two months later. How is the review still ongoing? How, is, how, how have you not come to a conclusion about what sure. kind of assistance? Um, I, I do believe that uh, Department of Defense is, is leading that review, uh, but I have to check on the status. I just don't have it, uh, a status update in front of me. Um, but I also want to be very clear in saying that, you know, it doesn't – the fact that we're conducting this overall review uh, doesn't uh, prevent us or preclude the fact that we're um, assessing our current sales, uh, looking at end-use monitoring, and being very clear uh, in, our, uh, uh, in our cooperation with uh, Saudi Arabia that they understand uh, our concerns about – uh, uh, some of the uh, flaws in their targeting uh, approach and that led to, as you know, the uh, you noted the, uh, the terrible attack on this funeral procession. procession. And then just um, yeah, please. Uh, sorry, I guess I just uh, slipped out of my head. No worries. Come back to you. No worries. I'm here all day on the same topic. Now we, we understand it's some years before this particular uh, deal, you know, is, is delivered. It is fair to say that Saudi Arabia is using overwhelmingly or overwhelmingly using American weapons and its war in, in Yemen. Would you agree with that? Would you agree uh, that just, it is using F-16s, Apache helicopters, 
you know, whatever. I mean, which are I'm not, American supply. I'm not, uh, I'm not saying you're wrong. I just don't have the, you know, to say that they're overwhelmingly using uh, U.S. Uh, weaponry. But, I mean, you, the United we have a strong, States robust. Is, is the major supplier of arms to Saudi Arabia, correct? We have a strong military sales relationship with Saudi Arabia. I will not dispute that. Remember, do you feel that, I mean, specifically going to what the what Human Rights Watch and what other rights groups have said, like, how do you respond to the criticism that that effectively or at least could risk the U.S. being complicit in these civilian deaths and in sort of the inaccurate targeting, whoever it might be? Well, again, let's – so a couple of uh, thoughts there. One is that, you know, uh, the coalition, and in, in, in particular Saudi Arabia, did not – uh, choose this fight. Uh, this is um, uh, a result of spillover uh, from the uh, war in Yemen, the conflict in Yemen. That was, frankly, putting at risk uh, uh, Saudis uh, who are living across the border um, and, uh, and about, frankly, uh, defending uh, their sovereign territory. Um, that said, we have uh, seen in their particular targeting, uh, and the most egregious example was this uh, uh, strike on the funeral procession, procession uh, inaccuracies uh, that put civilians clearly at, at great risk. We've been very clear about our concerns. And in fact, um, the Saudis immediately after that uh, bombing did conduct uh, an investigation and made public uh, the results of that investigation. Um, going forward, uh, obviously, we've asked them to look at fundamentally how they review and how they determine their targeting. Um, uh, our cooperation that we provide to Saudi Arabia uh, does not include, uh, and I think we've talked about this before, uh, target selection uh, or review. Um, and as I said, none of it constitutes endorsement of uh, offensive operations uh, in Yemen uh, that have harmed civilians. But the Saudi war goal is to restore the ousted president. I'm sorry? The Saudi war goal is to restore the ousted president of Yemen. Well, again... The, the breaches of the border happened after the conflict began. But, David, but... And you know the Secretary has worked very hard in this regard. I mean, there is a UN process. We saw a breakdown when... Um, you just described the Saudi action as not of their own choice. They were reacting to cross-border attacks. Well, that is – that is true. I mean, but this is – fight to spill put over, power? This is a conflict that has spilled over across their border. Um, they have taken steps to defend uh, Saudi territory, uh, defend their citizens. Um, but what's, again, important here is that there is a UN-led process uh, that, frankly, um, most recently took a hit earlier this week. Um, we thought we were close a couple of times to getting a cessation of hostilities uh, into place. But there is a process here uh, whereby we can uh, end the fighting uh, and bring about uh, a peaceful transition. But it takes all sides, obviously. To, to it feels like you're making excuses for them that they wouldn't make for themselves. How so? Oh, that they're that – Their stated war goal is to restore the uh, uh, Yemeni president. I, I – again, I, I – um, well, I'm not going to speak on behalf of the, the Saudis, but, uh, you know, they they have also been uh, helpful in trying to get this peace process up and running. Mark, please. You said uh, – you, you mentioned the hit that uh, the U.N. effort uh, took earlier this week. But that was, you know, landed by uh, – that hit was landed by – I agree. The, the, by the government I'm that well the Saudi Arabia supports and you guys support and so on. So. What measures are you willing to take to give this, uh, you know, UN effort some sort of a backbone or ground to stand on? What? I'm sorry, one more time. Well, I said, what are you doing to, to sort of give this UN position, you know, that was taken well, some, secretary has been, some strength and The Secretary veracity. has been very engaged in this. And, uh, you know, I spoke about this the other day. Um, you know, uh, he's been – I mean, I can look at recent calls. He's obviously been working also at the same time. Um, but to your uh, question, which is that uh, earlier this week it was the Republic of Yemen uh, government that said – rejected, essentially, the U.N. Uh, drafted roadmap. And I came out and 
spoke about at the top of the briefing and said, everybody's got to agree to this. It's not an end point. It's a starting point. Everybody's got to make concessions uh, in order for there to be peace. Um, and we're going to continue those efforts. I mean, the uh, Secretary has been working the phones. Uh, he's been continuing to discuss it with uh, you know, other regional uh, Gulf partners uh, in trying to get uh, some kind of cessation of hostilities back up and running. We were closed a couple weeks ago, uh, but he remains hard at it. Please. Uh, earlier today, Japanese Parliament ratified the TPP. Uh, what is your reaction? Uh, I mean, that's uh, obviously, uh, you know, we uh, we welcome uh, Japan's endorsement of the TPP. Uh, as we've said uh, all along, and this administration said all along, we believe that uh, the TPP is uh, uh, important uh, for the region uh, in establishing uh, strong uh, rules of the road in terms of our trade relations with our partners in the region, uh, and that it's in certainly in uh, uh, everyone's interest who's uh, looking at the TPP and has signed on to the TPP uh, to see it uh, come into uh, uh, effect. This is great policy, isn't it? Well, look, it, it speaks to the fact, and we've seen this on climate change as well, it speaks to the fact that you know, regardless of the transition that is happening here in the United States, I'm not going to speak to that or what decisions the incoming administration may make uh, with regard to climate or with regard to trade policy. But the rest of the world is moving forward. The rest of the world is, uh, with respect to climate, with respect to trade, uh, and TPP, we've seen it today, is saying embracing uh, 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 this progress. Um, so we can choose to engage or not to engage. but. It's not at the top as it is an announcement of a, an, another breakthrough for U.S. <laughs> trade policy. You mentioned it in passing when we ask. There was a time you would have celebrated a TPP endorsement. I, I'm just causing trouble. Go on. Yeah, you are. <laughs> Pakistan. Please. Uh, earlier this week, Pakistan's counterterrorism department raided the headquarters of the minority Ahmadiyya community in Pakistan. And just this morning, the chairman of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom strongly condemned this act. What is the State Department doing to protect the vulnerable Ahmadis in light of <coughs> disturbing development? Sure. Uh, we're obviously very concerned about these reports uh, and that Punjab counterterrorism police have raided uh, uh, the international headquarters of the uh, Ahmadiyya, Ahmadiyya rather, uh, Muslim community in Rabwa and arrested, uh, as you noted, four individuals for publishing literature. Uh, we have uh, regularly noted our concerns about uh, Pakistani laws that restrict uh, peaceful religious expression, uh, in particular by the uh, Ahmadiyya community uh, in our international religious uh, freedom report. Uh, we believe such laws are inconsistent with uh, Pakistan's uh, international obligations, and we would urge uh, the government of Pakistan to protect religious freedom and basic rights uh, of all members of its population, including religious minorities. Thank you. Do you want to comment on the increased uh, attacks against Muslims in Myanmar? I mean, since, uh, you know, you, you mentioned the Ahmadiyya and so on. Because uh, yeah. apparently, you know, tensions are rising and major Muslim countries like Indonesia and Malaysia are beginning to, you know, look towards this issue with, uh, with concern and hostility. Well, I don't have uh, uh, much of an update. Um, you know, um, we obviously continue to call for a prompt resolution of uh, full humanitarian and, and media access to that region, uh, Rakhine State. Um, I, I will say that earlier today, our ambassador to Burma uh, and 13 of his counterparts in Rangoon issued a joint statement urging all authorities to uh, overcome the obstacles that have uh, presented uh, a full resumption of humanitarian assistance in this area. Is that it, guys? Can I ask one question? Of course on you can. Palestinian Israeli issue. I'm sorry. Yesterday, the, 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 the jumping up in her seat, but yeah, no, I'm not going to let you go without asking <laughs> one question. Yesterday, Congress overwhelmingly voted for a $600 million, uh, in addition to the $38 billion and to, for, to Israel, to develop rockets and so on, to develop missiles. And at the same time, the Israeli government is deciding to compensate the Amona settlement people with half a million Israeli shekels, you know, which is like $150,000. So you think Israel needs the money when you when you give them you know six hundred million dollars on the one hand and they turn around and they give the the Amona residents you know half we, a million shekels? Sure. And look, um, uh, we've discussed uh, uh, your views on this before. 
Um, our, our, our security relationship uh, with Israel is ironclad, our security mm -hmm. commitment uh, with Israel is ironclad. Um, that said, um, you know, when we do have disagreements on other aspects of uh, Israel's policy, uh, we're not shy about uh, making those uh, concerns uh, clear uh, with regard to settlements. That's one of those areas. Um, but uh, uh, we believe that uh, uh, Israel is a strong partner and friend in the region, and that its security uh, is critically important to the United States' own national security interests. That's it. Thanks, guys. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, I didn't Did mean to. Did you want to comment on the impeachment mm -hmm. vote in South Korea? Uh, I do. I mean, very briefly, I just wanted to, uh, I can just say that um, uh, obviously we've been following it closely. Um, uh, first and foremost, uh, the United States continues to be a steadfast ally, friend, and partner uh, to the Republic of Korea. Um, we certainly look forward to working with uh, Prime Minister Huang in his new capacity as acting president. Uh, we expect and we uh, uh, believe uh, that policy consistency and continuity across a range of fronts, including uh, DPRK, is paramount, um, as well as international economics and trade. Uh, I can say that the U.S.-Korea uh, relationship and alliance will continue to be a linchpin of regional stability and security. We're going to continue to meet all of our alliance commitments especially with, with respect to defending uh, against the threats uh, we've seen emanating from North Korea. So, I'll end there. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead, Matt. Yeah, sure. Um, how important, given the, the threat that um, you say North Korea um, poses, how important is it that the, the transition in uh, the political transition in the ROK is a smooth one? Uh, it's critically important. Um, and, you know, it's again why my, you know, the initial uh, uh, words out of my mouth were to uh, certainly to convey that the United States uh, stands by uh, its steadfast ally and is there uh, with the, uh, Korea as it uh, undergoes this uh, political change and transition. Um, I would note also that, you know, during this time of political change, that South Koreans have uh, acted peacefully, they've acted calmly, and they've acted responsibly. And uh, that certainly speaks to uh, uh, your question, is that uh, it's absolutely critical uh, that we remain a steadfast ally and partner and that this transition uh, occurs as peacefully as possible. Thanks, guys.